Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 8, Non-Infectious Diseases and Disorders. This is video 22 and we're going to be looking at hearing loss and technology. We've uh, put together a couple of videos just to look at the ear, the eye and the kidney and some of the issues associated with disorders of each of those key organs. What we're going to do in the next couple of videos is have a look at each of those organs once again specifically, but in terms of some of the ways that technology is being used to help overcome or at least address some of the issues associated with uh, kidney function, with uh, eye dysfunction, and in this video, with hearing loss. So we're going to look at uh, cochlear implants, bone conduction implants, and hearing aids. And as always, this is just going to be an overview. So off, uh, there will be off, obviously opportunities for you to deal with some of these in a little bit more depth. So we want you obviously to recall those different forms of hearing loss to be able to explain or at least identify some technologies that are associated with correcting hearing losses, and perhaps ideally to be able to evaluate the effectiveness of different types of technologies associated with correcting hearing losses and try and get a feel for which ones are most appropriate for different situations. So firstly, just a reminder um, that we've got some different types of hearing losses. Hearing losses are could be conductive hearing losses. So that could be something as simple as having a lot of earwax in your ears, which is blocking your ears, uh, through to problems with the cochlea itself, the, the cochlea not functioning properly. So even if those hair cells are stimulated, um, there's still nothing that's actually happening between the cochlea and the, the brain through the auditory nerve. So depending on the type of problem associated, there's three main um, strategies that we can use to assist with hearing loss. The first of those, uh, probably the simplest of those is hearing aids. And I'm sure you've seen people who've been wearing hearing aids. Um, you may also have seen people who've had bone conduction implants or even cochlear implants. And these tend to be located just behind the ear. And whether or not they're just um, devices that sit in the ear and hang over the, the pinup part of the ear, or whether they're actually um, surgically implanted uh, into the skull, that's going to determine what type of hearing loss we're looking at and also um, what sort of correction is happening. Let's firstly look at hearing aids. So hearing aids are the ones that fit to the outer part of the ear. So they're about converting, basically they're amplifiers. So their the primary job is to amplify. So they'll take sound energy, convert it into electrical energy and then amplify the sound um, to make it bigger, to make it louder. Now, obviously, there has to be um, no major problems with what's happening internally because just making the sound bigger isn't going to help if there's an actual problem uh, in the middle or inner ear. Having said that, if it's simply an issue where maybe a larger sound, an amplified sound, will be able to um, trigger those little hair cells um, and therefore that the, the cochlea will do its job to be able to um, transfer those um, stimuli through the auditory nerve to the brain for processing, then a hearing aid may be the most appropriate type of a device. Because they amplify sound, there has to be some residual hearing ability. So this is one of the key things that's associated with hearing aids. If you can't hear at all, um, then this particular device is not going to be uh, of much help. Uh, however, where they are useful, uh, they can um, have a significant impact on things like comprehension, on speech, and also on low frequency discrimination. One of the things that you might um, know of people who maybe um, who have hearing aids that sometimes um, maybe have complaints about those are often in high frequency ranges or where there's a lot of people talking all at once, uh, where there are loud noises because that can create feedback. Uh, and obviously these things are battery operated so the batteries can also um, run out. So there's a few limitations associated with the use of hearing aids, but they're a nice simple device. They're easy to install. Uh, they're usually, of all of the options, the cheapest of the options, but there does need to be some residual hearing ability 
um, for you to get the best out of a hearing aid. Probably second in line in terms of cost and uh, I guess in terms of what how we're trying to correct hearing loss is bone conduction implants. Now these are used for patients with low frequency hearing loss so the uh, hearing aids are not going to be particularly helpful but that do have a function in cochlea so therefore if we can get the um, sound vibrations through to the cochlea then we should still be able to have um, this processing of sound happening okay. Um, the bone conduction implants are primarily now titanium based devices and they're um, placed into the skull behind the ear. They're taking advantage of the fact that sound um, moves via vibrations. We actually know that sound moves faster um, through solids because the particles are closer together and it's easier for them to, to vibrate backwards and forwards. Um, and so a bone conduction implant is going to take advantage basically of this um, kind of property in that it's going to focus and repair some functions associated with those little bones that we talked about in the middle ear enabling the sound vibrations to reach that functioning cochlea so that it can then be transmitted through the auditory nerve to the brain and that those images, uh, those uh, stimuli can be interpreted. It's a little more costly obviously than a hearing aid but not quite as costly as a cochlear implant. So the bone conduction implants probably sit somewhere in the middle in terms of um, uh, cost and functionality, I guess, in one sense, but they are very much um, associated with still some functioning of the cochlea. So what happens if there's a problem with the cochlea? Well, then you need a cochlear implant. And these are ones that are placed surgically behind the ear. You may sometimes um, see people with cochlear implants and they are going to take the sound, they're going to convert it into radio signals that are then going to be sent and converted again into electrical impulses. So now we know that there's, there's no point in trying to stimulate the cochlea because we know that there's a problem in the cochlea and it's not uh, doing the job that it's designed to do. So if there's damage to the hair cells, um, and that's going to mean we've got quite profound hearing loss. These are, these are significantly um, more serious in terms of hearing loss than some of the others that we've looked at up to this point. And so what we want is a device that's basically going to mimic those hair cells, convert the sound into electrical energy that can then um, stimulate the auditory nerve and transmit those messages through to the brain. Children who are born deaf um, can often have um, some significant acquisition of language and um, improved social skills with the use of cochlear implants and they've certainly become a quite significant uh, technology that's associated with these sorts of hearing disorders. The downside I guess to cochlear implants, hearing is only about 80% as effective as someone with normal hearing. Now if you were profoundly deaf or you were born um, deaf that's a massive increase on what you might have otherwise had um, and there can be a few problems associated with static and as with any surgical procedure, and I think we should probably um, regard this any time we're talking about surgery, um, there can always be some risks associated with surgery. Obviously, surgical techniques too are becoming much more precise, uh, more keyhole, so they're, they're uh, much more targeted. They tend to um, increase the um, amount of time that people um, can recover or decrease the amount of time, I guess you might say, um, for recovery time. So um, increased healing, minimizing damage, those sorts of things. But risks can always be associated with any form of surgery. What might be useful for you is to put each of these three different types of technologies associated with hearing loss into a table um, for comparison, because that's one of the key things that we want you to do in this particular um, section is to be able to evaluate the effectiveness of technology in um, dealing with particular types of disorders and in this case hearing losses. So that'd be a really good activity to do following this video. Thanks for watching.